Hello and welcome to Voices of Blue Scope, the podcast where we go behind the scenes at Blue Scope to meet the people who create strength every day. I'm your host, Martin Feld. Thank you for joining us. In this episode, we're featuring a one-on-one interview with Tanya Archibald, the new chief executive of Blue Scope Australian Steel Products. Tanya took the time to meet with us in person and share her story as a long-time Blue Scope employee. She also elaborated on the experience of assuming the chief executive role and what she sees as the most significant challenges and opportunities for Blue Scope in Australia, now and in the future. Let's cross to the interview. Thank you for joining us, Tanya. It's great to have you on the podcast. Thank you, Martin. Lovely to be here. First question is a rather simple one. I'm mm. going to take you back. Mm. Can you tell me the story about how you actually came to work at Blue Scope? What brought you ah, here? Ah, okay, right. So I began my working life as a chartered accountant. I was with uh, Arthur Anderson, which one of the big four, or big six, or big eight, whatever they were. And uh, I saw an ad in the newspaper, uh, and it was about uh, it was deliberately targeted at chartered accountants to come into BHP through the internal audit channel. And it was a stepping stone into corporate was the way it was was termed. And I thought, yep, I might give that a go. I was familiar with BHP. They were actually my audit client, uh, BHP Minerals at one point. It had been a few years previous. Um, So I was familiar with the organisation. So I thought, yep, that's what I want to do. So I applied for the job and got the job. Fantastic. Now, working as a chartered accountant, you have a relationship with numbers. Mm. What interests you about numbers? The story they tell you. You, know, you spend a bit of time looking at the numbers, but really it's the story, it's the where have we been, where are we going, what are the issues, what are, you, what are the challenges, and you can generally pick that story up as you read through the numbers, but also talking to the people. You try and put the two together, so it's, to me it's all about the story and what it's telling you. And moving from that probably more comfortable sphere as an accountant into somewhere like BHP and now Blue Scope, what was that transition like and how did you have to adjust going from that earlier career to this new role? Yeah, it was interesting. When I, um, when I first joined BHP, so this is back in the mid-90s, and this was in corporate, uh, in, it started off in internal audit, and I, I almost resigned in the first six weeks. It felt very bureaucratic. It, it seemed a little different to what I'd expected, but I felt it was important to stick at it, and I'm glad I did, because very quickly, I think once you get into the organisation, I was very lucky. The, um, back in those days, a lot of the uh, travel uh, for the international projects was all done out of Melbourne. Uh, and so I very quickly got to visit Vietnam. I think I went to Vietnam, oh gosh, it was within the, within the first couple of months. Uh, visited Vietnam, which was then the Dai Hung project, petroleum project. I went to Hartley Platinum uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, which was another interesting project. I uh, spent a lot of time in Asia. So very quickly, once I started travelling around the organisation, visiting various places, uh, Western Port, the reautomation of the hot strip mill uh, in the middle of winter. Uh, it's one thing that really stuck in my mind about Western Port, so it was nice to go there quite recently uh, in the summertime. But no, they were really, really quite interesting projects, very interesting locations. So. Um, after a sort of initial period, it was a, a good place to be. So I spent about 18 months or so, I think it was, in the, in the internal order group, and then I moved into the international division. Uh, and that's because I'd spent quite a bit of time working in Asia, and it was really looking at some of the number of, um, I guess, some of the issues that we had in a couple of the businesses. Uh, and from there, uh, in the late 90s, I moved to Indonesia as the finance lead uh, with the, the steel group. And that's where I was when... Uh, the demerger occurred with, with BHP and we became BHP Steel and then Blue Scope. And of course, Blue Scope's first major investment was in Vietnam. And because the markets were broadly similar, um, so we, the, the line was specifically designed for that lighter gauge uh, market with alternative products. Um, and so I moved to Vietnam and I was there for almost five years, I think it was, ended up being. So we spent a year to negotiate for the licence, a couple of years to build, and then a, I think it was about a year and a half to operate. So that was, that was a fantastic project. And I think anyone who gets the opportunity to work on one of those greenfield projects, even brownfield projects, they're so rewarding. They're you know, very challenging. You, you get to actually take a, gr- and a clean sheet of paper and you you build the asset, but you also build the team, the culture, um, the systems, the processes. So that was a, an incredibly rewarding project for me to work on. I'm fascinated by the fact that you said when you joined, you just went instantly into all these different projects. You're traveling around the place, multiple sites, it's global. 
beyond that initial bureaucratic feeling yeah. and sense that you were dealing with these processes, mm. what were some observations that you made about the company culture and maybe some more specific things about the places that you visited? Like, was it different in Vietnam versus here? What did you sense as you met people around the place? Yeah, I, I, I've probably thought deeper about culture in uh, probably the last 10 years as opposed to the first 10 years because it's been 25 years now. There's something very special, I think, about Blue Scale Culture. I think we are an organisation whereby fundamentally we want to do the right thing. Um, and you see that no matter where you go, that's reflected in how we deal with our people, our customers, our suppliers, how we think about safety, how we think about wellbeing. And that does make us different. And I find it interesting, sometimes often when people leave, there's often a desire to come back into the organisation because I think we treat people fairly and with respect. Um, and I think that's that's clearly something that's important to us. How do you think those early experiences travelling and living and working somewhere like Vietnam, how do you think that changed you as a person? You've got to know the market, you've got to know the customers. Um, I think you've got to operate as a team. In Indonesia was fascinating because it was that was my first operating role and of course it was the back end of the Asian financial crisis. Uh, our markets had collapsed, our customers had no money and we basically had to reinvent ourselves. And so that constant need for, for reinvention, what you're doing, how you're doing it, how you take your products to market, that's, I mean, that's basically where the, um, the alternative products came from, so the, the um, Zacks, BZACs, etc. So yeah, the, the reinvention. So I think, and the role of, and probably where my thoughts have gone in the last 10 years or so, is really the role of the finance person, because you do... Um, I spent a long time obviously in the finance stream and you do get that perspective right across the organisation in terms of where the value is sitting and the value drivers. Um, and so it's a, yeah, it was a, it's a good role. And what are some of your most interesting, or I suppose, personal memories from that demerger period when Blue Scope really became Blue Scope? Do you remember any particular challenges or interesting moments that you had to encounter in that time? It was pretty exciting. I mean, I do remember someone calling me from, from BHP corporate and saying, do you want to come back into corporate and, and go with the, the merger? And thinking, no, because I'm actually having a lot of fun here. This is my first real um, operating role, uh, in a sense, in, in the finance room, but in an operating business unit. And I really wanted to stay there because I was learning a lot. I do remember the, uh, the excitement of the Vietnam project being announced uh, as the first major investment. Uh, and it was a real sense of the tagline that we had at the time, and I actually still think it holds, is you know, a different kind of steel company. Um, and the fact that we were, uh, still do have a premium brand, a differentiated product, that makes us pretty unusual, unique in the steel industry. And there's something a little bit special about that. And you mentioned earlier that you became a financial lead or you moved into that role. What was the story that came after that? Where did your career progress in those following years? Yeah, so the, the, the thing about the when I went to Vietnam and I was the finance lead there, I felt like I didn't really do much in terms of you know, the pure accounting. It was all about the strategy, um, what we're going to sell, how we're going to sell it, how we're going to set the business up, the systems, the processes. And so it was a, it was a very broad role and it, it sort of spanned all of the different phases um, of a project from, from starting with the initial negotiations with government uh, through the build process and through a, a start-up process. So when I was in Indonesia, it was really interesting because other than the person who, who sold the stuff and the person who made the stuff, the finance role was really quite broad. And that's probably why I ended up in Vietnam, where when we're going through that build process, negotiate, build and operate, um, again, you, you can take this quite broad role in terms of what are you going to sell, how are you going to sell it, um, how's the channel going to be structured, what customers are we going to sell to, um, how do we align that to the operations, what are the capital requirements, what are the working capital requirements of the business. So it was a very broad role. Uh, when I got to the, um, into my fifth year in Vietnam, that had been eight years all up um, between Indonesia and Vietnam, I was very keen to go home, uh, back to Australia, I had ageing parents. Our role came up uh, in the strategy team uh, in Melbourne and uh, so I moved uh, back to Melbourne with my husband who I'd met and married uh, in Vietnam. Um, he, he was originally from Melbourne, he'd spent a lot of time in Japan and then he was uh, working in Vietnam. Um, and so we were both quite keen to get home uh, for personal reasons. So a role came up in the strategy team uh, and it was a really interesting time because it was before the GFC hit, it was the peak market. and. 
in some respects it felt like the strategy was change nothing, just keep turning out all of that product. Uh, and then of course when the GFC hit and everything turned on its head, it was a, it was a very interesting time. It was a good learning experience I think when you go through those tough times um, and you see some pretty tough decisions being made. That was very interesting. So I had the strategy group. Um, after a couple of years, I then picked up the corporate finance team, which does uh, the M&A uh, side of things. Uh, we made a couple of pretty interesting acquisitions. Uh, we picked up all kind of fielders. Uh, we did the uh, PSG acquisition in New Zealand. In my mind, they were good, clever, close to the core acquisitions. They made a lot of sense. Uh, and then at that time, I'd spent a lot of time looking at how we think about the Australian business and specifically we obviously had a, an issue with the cost structure and spent a lot of time slicing and dicing it and trying to work out what's what's the answer uh, and then when the role came up the the finance lead role in the bands businesses it then was moving into that role it it almost felt to some extent a little bit seamless because even though it was uh, back into a business unit a very big uh, complex operating business unit but I had a clear view in my mind about what needed to be achieved um, and of course the team did a fantastic job and this is where the the genius of John Nowlin comes into it uh, the amount of cost uh, and and productivity that he really led in the organization uh, and then for us to be able to take that and communicate it back to the board the key stakeholders about what's possible here that was a great experience to have um, working with the team uh, and you know real real time of transformation um, and it was a real privilege to have that role uh, and then of course moving um, uh, back into the CFO role in 2018 and the CFO role it's back into the finance stream and it's very different again from those those business unit roles you know in the business you're really you're managing the assets and you're delivering to the customers in the corporate role and the CFO role you're managing the balance sheet and you're dealing with the owners, uh, the equity holders and the, the debt capital markets. So the quite important stakeholders uh, and very different sets of needs and, the, and the, the interaction between the businesses and the, and the corporate team, the rubber really hits the road when it comes to capital allocation and you've got major projects and you're trying to work out what is the, where is the best place to allocate the capital. You want to keep a strong balance sheet given who we are and the cyclical nature of the industry in which we operate and the big capital decisions we make. Um, you've got to work out the right amount of capital to put back to shareholders, but also the right amount of capital to have in the business. Um, and, and that includes the growth capital as well. And climate, there's an awful lot of time, I think in the time that I started at the role, uh, in the CFO role, I remember the, uh, the first time we really started talking about sustainability in the investor roadshows. It was one of the half year roadshows we might have done something like 40 meetings, which is normal. Uh, I think three of them actually mentioned sustainability, and I think two of them were probably a tick-the-box exercise, and one of them actually meant it. And if I then fast-forward a couple of years through probably 21, 22, it's just completely turned on its head, the amount of acceleration that we've seen in that space on climate and transition in particular. Every single meeting that we would do would, would have that as a key focus. Uh, and the ESG uh, day that we've run here in Port Kembla for the last couple of years, that's got a bigger attendance list than anything else that we do, by and large. And the ESG roadshow that follows it is bigger than anything we do with the financial results roadshow. So an awful lot of time uh, on uh, climate and transition. And so coming into the chief executive uh, of the Australian business role, that really helps understanding where investors are coming from. I've got a you know pretty clear view around our own strategies, our decarbonisation pathways. We've obviously got our 2030 targets, our 2050 net zero goal. And so that having that grounding, I think, obviously helps. But having John alongside me uh, for a while, that's fantastic, that's gold, because uh, he's such a genius uh, when it comes to the operating side of the business, um, obviously the whole uh, manufacturing space. Uh, and so I'm very grateful for the support that he's, he's giving me at the moment. That's a super comprehensive account and it brings, it brings us perfectly long, to the now. Answer. No, no, I love it. And focusing on that role that you've now taken on, mm -hmm. what does it mean to you to have this role? Thinking about you know, where things have come from with John, this is very, very holistic. Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you to work in this role now? Oh, it's an enormous privilege. I mean, it's just, 
Uh, I mean, it's such a, a large, complex, iconic um, organisation, I think. You know, I've been trying to get out uh, as much as I can um, and meet the teams, um, visit the site. So um, I've been to a couple of the uh, places in Port Kembla so far. Uh, I was at Western Port earlier this week, uh, obviously back up in uh, Port Kembla this week. Uh, next week um, I'm in Queensland and visiting quite a number of the sites up there. Uh, the plan is to get to South Australia, I think it's at the back end of March. Um, we've got a number of, of visits that we're in the process of planning. Uh, and then I've got to backtrack um, to the rest of the sites around Sydney and uh, Melbourne. And then we're going to get to WA, I think, in the middle of the year. So it's really about trying to just get out and, and talk to people and, and see what they're doing, see how they're going, um, see the assets. And part of that will also meet up with some customers as well over the next couple of months. So um, so far it's been, a, it's been a great experience. Everyone's been very welcoming, very generous with their time. The people, I think, in this business... Uh, very hard working, very diligent. Um, I think they've got a can-do attitude. <laughs> By and large, very humble people. So for me to be able to work with a great team of people, uh, an incredible set of products that we have, you know, everyone knows Colourbond, of course, uh, and the work that's been done in that space over the last, what, what is it, four, five, six years or so, um, it's been fantastic. But also True Spec, True Core, I mean, you could just go on and on. So great set of people, great products, channels, so I, I think there's an, an awful lot um, of exciting times in front of us. And climate and transition, I think it's important we don't just focus on how we deal with the decarbonisation of our assets. I think what's also important is that we think about who we are and what we do. Lightweight, infinitely recyclable products that go into building and construction. There's a lot of opportunity there, whether it's how we think about our coating systems, our paint systems, uh, energy efficient buildings, the applications that we can provide. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity there and we've got some good projects going on uh, and I think the question in my mind is do we actually need to bring that together in a bit more of a cohesive strategy because I do think there's an upside uh, here in terms of how we think about climate and transition. So we've spoken about some of the upcoming opportunities. What do you see as some of the future challenges or current challenges for the business? Some of the challenges that we've got to work our way through uh, clearly, climate and transition is one of them. Inflation, uh, you know, we're seeing inflation now that we haven't seen in, gosh, I don't know, 10 years plus. So inflation is, for, for a, a large in, industrial asset base such as ours, that's a, that's a key challenge that we're going to need to work with. Uh, labour is another one that we're going to have to really work with. And, and the, the labour shortages that we're seeing right across the Australian economy, um, it's, you know, we're not unique in that particular problem but how we attract people and how we retain people um, is going to be a key focus. And of course, uh, customer experience, I mean, COVID and uh, all of the strong demand and of course all of the weather events just broke a whole lot of things. Uh, and so there's been an enormous effort put into how we can try and recover the customer experience. So a lot of effort into the die fault recovery, the backlog recovery, but how do we take that to the next level? You know, how do we absolutely delight our customers? So I think there's a number of areas there um, that we're obviously going to be focused on over the next couple of years. Yes, those are all very important themes. Mm -hmm. And no doubt people who've been listening to this podcast so far have a very good impression now of who you are and what you've done, what you stand mm -hmm. for. But more explicitly, what do you think is important about being a leader based on your own experience? And what kind of leader do you want to be at ASP? Hopefully one that engages with people. Um, I like to walk around, I like to chat, I like to see people. Um, I think one of the challenges we've obviously had to deal with post-COVID is around what the, the working model uh, actually is in terms of engaging with people. Well, you know, we've still got quite a few people on screens and whatnot. So for me, it's about um, personal engagement. Um, it's about spending time with people. It's about understanding what they're doing, what their challenges are, what their opportunities are. I think maybe the other part of it, I think, is how do we drive the organisation into the future? And you know, the, the one thing that we're, well, I'm very clear about, and I think we're all very clear about is, I'll tell you a little story, the backtrack for a moment. Many years ago when I first joined BHP, a friend said to me, well, what, are you, what are you joining BHP for in the steel, working in the steel area? It's a sunset industry. And I think if you fast forward to today, I think that's completely turned on its head yes, yeah, still might have uh, a technology challenge that we have to deal with as, as we go through decarbonisation over the next couple of decades. But steel is, it's in everything, you know, it's the, 
It's the car you drive, the bridge you drive over, the house you live in. It's the stuff all around us right now. They're all made from steel or processes made from steel. So steel's not going anywhere and it's going to drive a critical role in decarbonisation. So wind towers and solar farms and, and clean energy um, transmission. So I think steel has got an enormous future and I think we've got a, a very clear role to play in that. So I see a very healthy future for us. I think transition's just going to be a little bit challenging and a little bit choppy but I'm also confident that we've got the right people that will work our way through it. So I think we've got an incredibly exciting future with some great products and some fantastic people. When you think about all of the challenges you've faced, the roles you've worked in, the people you've met, this new role here, if you had to boil down your time at Blue Scope to a key memory or lesson that you've learned, what would you say is the most significant moment that you've had in this company? I mean, I would always go back to my time in Vietnam as being quite formative, um, just in terms of the ability to create a business from scratch. Um, so I think that was pretty important. But I've been pretty lucky with a number of the roles that I've had, um, the ability to move in between the corporate team and the business unit teams, and they all bring something different. And I, it's sometimes it's hard to point to particular moments. I think you tend to layer things one on top of each other. So there's there's been fascinating times, I think, throughout the entire, gosh, what is it, 26 years, which makes me a bit of a baby in, in, in uh, ASP standards. So it's hard to point, I find it hard to point to one particular time. Um, I've, I've been pretty lucky with the different roles that I've had and the teams that I've worked with uh, and the people that I've worked for. They've all been rewarding in their own different way. I would come back to, I think, coming into this role, I'm just enormously excited by it. I think we've got a very healthy future. I think it's an exciting future. We've got a few challenges that we have to get through, but I think there's a pretty exciting path in front of us. Well, this has been a wonderful chat and lovely to get to know you better. Thank you so much for sharing your Thank story you, and uh, views on the podcast. Yeah, delighted. Delighted to be here. Thank you. We hope that you enjoyed our interview with Tanya. We also thank her for her time in joining the podcast. To learn more about the topics that were discussed, view this episode's links and show notes in your podcast app or at bluescope.com. You can also find a video excerpt of this interview at TV Bluescope on YouTube. Thank you for listening to the Voices of Bluescope podcast. Until next time.